I just had, I don't know why I've had like a, a series of Brits on the podcast recently. I just had a poet from uh, London and then I had a friend from uh, Brighton down there in the South. And I was just like, how, how do I have like four Brits in a row coming on uh, the podcast? But, <laughs> Have you been to Britain? Uh, when I was younger, yes, I went to London uh, as a kid with my parents and then um, Edinburgh. So I was like 13 at the time, but like, okay. yeah, I remember at the time it was like a mad cow disease was going around in the news and everybody was, my mother oh, was freaking gosh. out about like, oh, yeah. don't eat any meat when you're traveling. Don't eat any meat when you're traveling. That's oh. like my biggest memory. <laughs> that and like the castles. And it was August in London. So it was uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty hot compared to... Uh, where I uh, yeah. grew up over here in the States. But well, I'm, I'm married an American, so I've been many times. There you go. Yeah, and you have a trip coming up here for that Egger Award. Oh, yeah, gosh, yeah. It's only a couple of weeks, yeah. I can't believe how close it is. Yeah, well, that's that's great, man. That's fantastic. That's, uh, I mean, that's exciting, right? Like you're, even, I guess, even yeah, if you yeah. don't get it, right? I mean, even though you deserve to get it, right? Like it's, uh <laughs> It's just fun to go over there and and be in the mix of it all, you know, get that recognition. Yeah, yeah, I I I I'm very excited to you know to be over there and just to be you know in the Marriott Hotel and uh, with all those authors and uh, it's a yeah it's a dream come true. I uh, I think I knew when I was writing it at the back of my mind would would this get nominated for an Edgar um, because I've written previous books but they were slightly um, smaller academic books so. None had ever quite made it to to kind of Edgar levels, whereas this this one, thankfully, generated quite a lot of buzz. So I was looking up stuff. Uh, I didn't. There were a lot of Stephen Powell's when I was uh, researching and digging in here to write this intro. Yeah, it's strange. I kept seeing these uh, these Stephen Powell's. There was like a Stephen D. Powell's. Like that's not him. And then there was like another Stephen Powell that was like an American guy. I was like, that's not him. It's not there's, there's one in Utah who I think was involved in various kind of kidnappings and uh, I think there was an there was an Amazon documentary about him a, a very strange um, Stephen Powell unfortunately <laughs> I made the mistake I made the mistake of setting up a Google alert on my name and I've been inundated with stories of rapists murderers <laughs> swindlers you know. It's good content, though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, just... I mean, it's a really common name. In fact, there's a there's a there's a cancer specialist at the um, university I work at. There's a doctor, Stephen Powell. And I occasionally, get calls from people. Apparently, he's quite renowned in his field, so I occasionally get calls from people asking about uh, chemotherapy and all this sorts of thing. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm nowhere near clever enough or qualified to help you. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so. This is Andrew Whitstaff. And you are listening to Heavy Board, and we're recording this on April 18th, 2024. My guest today is the author Stephen Powell, one of the leading scholars of American crime fiction in the English-speaking world. A member of the Crime Writers Association and an honorary fellow in the English department at the University of Liverpool, Stephen has written and edited several books, including James Elroy, Demon Dog of Crime Fiction, A Hundred American Crime Writers, The Big Somewhere, Essays on James Elroy's Noor World, and Conversations with James Elroy, among others, as well as several chapters and essays in scholarly anthologies about crime fiction and noir. And his latest book is Changing the Game Yet Again, a comprehensive biography of the main figure in all of Stephen's work, the great American crime writer, James Elroy, entitled Love Me Fierce in Danger, The Life of James Elroy, available now from Bloomsbury, and of course is linked in the description of this episode, listeners. And Love Me Fierce in Danger 
has just been shortlisted for a 2024 Egger Award in the category of Best Critical Biographical Work, as well as a Keating Award in the same category. And it deserves it, listeners. Love Me Fierce in Danger has been called a masterpiece of literary biography by David Peace, and praised by Mark Sanderson in The Times as having all the pace and twists and shock of a good crime novel. Stephen also owns and operates The Venetian Vase, an online salon that includes a combination of blogs, interviews, essays, musings, comprehensive crime fiction research, an overall archive of his work with James Elroy, as well as an overall bibliography for all of Stephen's work, available at venetianvase.co.uk. He owns and operates a podcast titled Highbrow Lowbrow with his co-host Dan Slattery, and has recently launched a YouTube channel called Elroy Reader, where Stephen reads, reviews, and discusses novels and other works of fiction. I first came across Stephen and his work when he began popping into my Twitter feed, his latest book on Elroy gaining some much-deserved attention from all the various podcasts and websites and magazines in the crime fiction and noir world. His impressive contributions drawing the interest of crime fiction lovers all over the planet. And I asked Stephen on today to be given the heavy board treatment, going into his work on Elroy and other crime writers but also his own life and techniques as a writer of fiction and nonfiction, scholarly and pop. And I'm thrilled to bring his particular flavor of writing, reading, and comprehensive study to all of you out there. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me on. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure to have you here. Looking forward to this. Me too. I always like to start this off with uh, kind of more personal questions about the writer themselves. Uh, When I say, what was your childhood like? You know, how did you grow up? Where? uh, And then to kind of gear that towards something, how did that lead you towards reading and writing? Well, I, I, my childhood was mostly happy. I have very fond memories of my father. He was a cell operator at a chemical plant. And he didn't have much schooling, but he was a great autodidact. And he introduced me to novels at a very early age. So at the ages of, say, 11 or 12, I was reading Ian Fleming's James Bond novels and Bernard Cornwell's Sharp novels. Uh, Anything with a sense of adventure, anything with a sense of otherness. You know, I grew up in a small town, Chester, in in the UK, which is quite beautiful. It's an old Roman town, but it's also extremely dull. Yeah, it's not much going on. So I I love a good story. I love a good journey in fiction uh, and in fact, and I love to be taken somewhere and to escape into the realms of the imagination. And that's what I found authors did to me. James Alroy came a bit later. I was reading a lot of authors before I got to Alroy. I got to him about 16, but by that age, I'd gone through quite a few and um and i i suppose alroy was special i don't want to jump too far ahead in your program i suppose alroy was special because obviously you're taking me to america which almost has this kind of mystical mythical quality over here in britain even though we speak the same language it is a um a, a, a very alluring sexy violent but dangerous place <laughs> in England, you know uh, at least that's what the newspapers tell us and films and tv so um so i really i really loved uh, alroy for introducing me to los angeles and, and noir and 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 those sorts, sorts of things it was it was opening a whole a whole new world for me yeah that's always funny i always said like um the way that I guess we always romanticize each other the way Americans romanticize England, you know, in the UK. We're like, oh, this beautiful, quaint, old place that has these castles and these stone buildings. And look at the parliament. (laughs) Look at that building. You know, and it's always it's always a two way street, I guess, with that. Yeah. Yeah. So you started reading out as a as a child, like young child, like preteens, kind of when you got into the crime stuff. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the exact age. I know it was very, very young. And I know my my dad introduced me to basically novels. I didn't read that much kind of 
ch children's literature. Uh, uh, he, I, I just read his books. I would raid his shelves. And it was the age, really. I mean, my dad grew up in that kind of post-war paperback boom. And and he loved he just loved a good novel. So I would just I would just raid his shelves and then we'd talk about the books. And like me, he was a bit of a dreamer. Uh he he hadn't had much chance to travel and he ha he hadn't had a, a breakout career, he didn't really like his job. So he 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 had the same kind of um slightly romantic attachment to a to a good story and to a a good fantasy with a, a small F because um, he didn't actually like speculative fiction. He, he, he preferred a better grounding in reality. But uh, yeah, we, I think, uh, I think writers are, are, are born dreamers and readers and writers. We, we just share that, that love of what Alroy might call the wonder. Right. The, yeah. uh, just the kind of loveness that there's, there's, there's just something really great out there that you need to explore through adventure or, or just or, or, or just travel or of some kind you know absolutely and it's always like you said uh i always like the next one i like to go into usually is what were some of the first writers you were enamored with or like kind of your go-to inspiration you said fleming like i actually i'm running a series on doing some of the james bond books here with uh with a fellow brit over there uh and uh it's uh, it's always interesting going through kind of Fleming's stuff with his like just how I say like the early crime guys, especially you know American or British, they were enamored with these kind of I always say like the kind of uh, modernist writers, you know, like the Hemingway and these kind of these kind of writers that just the prose is incredibly clean. It's it's incredibly to the point and and actually quite literary. I you know crime always gets a bad rap for oh that's crime stuff, but it's like no no, <laughs> like read this yeah. stuff like it is incredible. Uh, so yeah, who were some of the first? You know you said Fleming and uh, obviously we're gonna get to Elroy here, but yeah, I am. Um, Bernard Cornwall was a big influence on me. I love the sharp novels, and I think. Although his prose wasn't quite as clean as Fleming, maybe because because the historical situations he 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 did, which was like um, the Peninsula War and the in the Napoleonic Wars, he he Bernard Cohen was very very good at taking you to another century, putting you in in it and making it seem so vibrant and real and alive. Uh, because I, as a kid, I just found it hard to imagine just living in another century without all of the uh, conveniences I, I had as a kid. I, it, I just, I, it just blew my mind. And Cornwall was the first person, Bernard Cornwall was the first person who made it seem possible. Of course, now I look back and think, I was a kid, I didn't have the internet. And of course, you know, but I'm glad I didn't now because uh, that would have um, uh, totally distracted me. So, Bernard Cornwall's sharp novels. He, he, did, he wrote a, a few set in America in the U.S. Civil War as well, but he actually abandoned that series. I, I could give you some names. I'm not sure how well all of them have translated across the Atlantic. Jack Higgins was a, a big one, and he was very prolific. Um, he wrote, I'm trying to think of a few that were filmed. Um, the Eagle Has Landed was filmed, um, Prayer for the Dying. But he could write two free novels um, a year and that really taught me he was the king of the paperback thriller and I used to devour his books and then after a while I began to realize they're all the same <laughs> and, I, so, and I remember almost feeling cheated by it um, really um, I, I, I almost felt like a, a sense of animosity towards Mr. Higgins after reading say a dozen or so of his books Um I, and I kind of went off him. I, I guess that's important in itself, um, you know, just being becoming disillusioned with a writer. There were others that I remember feeling a bit heartbroken for different reasons. I, I remember reading a lot of Eric Ambler, uh, the the spy writer, espionage writer, however you want to write it. But his work really tailed off probably after World War II. And reading his books and orders, I, I just really noticed the quality dipping, and he he lost a certain dynamism. It was almost like just as our body fails, the, there was like an energy level that went down in his books. Right, that right. being quite heart rending. Those were probably the earliest, uh, and then going forward later, I became more interested in kind of 
yeah, maybe more mature writers who are more interested in, in like the human condition, like say P.D. James, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, recently, Mo Hader. Um, oh, oh gosh, there's so many. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I always, and yeah, like my, my question is, you know, I'm a big McDonald fan, Ross McDonald, uh, love his stuff. And I guess mine are more American with, uh, Chandler, I like some, not all, right? Like he's, I feel like sometimes he's inconsistent, but again, his prose is always su- surprisingly clean for, because it became like a factory thing, you know, like that kind of nor writing, especially in America in the early part of the 20th century. If it was like a factory almost where they had these guys that they're paying, you know, a couple cents a word or whatever, cranking out these novels, you know, in three months, you know. Uh, but then you see the, the greats in and Hammett, obviously, was, was Hammett in there and... Uh, Absolutely. It, um, it, it's interesting because I hear a lot of writers today say, oh, I can't make any money in this and I really wish I was born at the wrong time. <laughs> but, but what they don't realize is when most of those writers of, the, of, the, of Black Mask and of the 30s and 40s Black Mask magazine, a lot of them were just exploited and really didn't make, it wasn't a sustainable career for them, you know, and, and um, the industry was changed. Great writers like Charles Williams and um david goodis many of them died broke and um it was hard for them i think they would be amazed uh and even chandler and hammett would kind of be amazed at the critical attention their work is getting today I, i'm sure they'd be delighted in, in in a slightly noir way but yeah at the time they were they were just kind of uh for the pulp grinder t- type writers that's interesting. I didn't. I didn't uh, prepare for this, but uh, what? When do you think that started? The kind of scholarly interest in in the kind of crime and noir? Because you're involved in this, so you're in the university setting, doing the important scholarly work like this. And I know, like the Library of America over here, has recently really made an effort in like the last thirty, forty years to kind of immortalize the at least the American crime writers on this side of the you know this side of the pond, as they say. But yeah. When, when did that kind of start? This. Uh, scholarly interest in that yeah i think it started like the late 80s early 90s and i think it it started with probably in, in improving popularity of american studies in general both like the american academy gaining more confidence in, in studying american writers and, and this huge movement in, in in american fiction which contrasted nicely with a lot of um the more British tradition, which was kind of golden age detective fiction, a lot of locked room mysteries and uh, kind of very class bound fiction. So the American one is almost kind of oppositional to that. And um, and it, it, it just snowballs, you know, a couple of articles are published and then that just starts a dialogue. And, and, and pe- people re- write articles in response to that. Then suddenly you get monographs, you get anthologies of essays. And the only thing that I can say is, you know, some academics excel at just studying one thing in particular or one writer in particular. When I started my Alroy PhD, there, there weren't any books on Alroy. Um, then in like my first year, I, I, a book came out by Peter Wolf called Like Hot Knives of the Brain, which was a, a fairly decent scholarly book on him. And then there was another one by a German academic, a wonderful woman called Anna Fluger. And that was James Elroy in the novel of Obsession. And I remember thinking, actually, oh, no, that there's going to be an avalanche and uh, I won't have anything <laughs> left to write about him. But as it turned out that, um, you know, I started writing about him, I got my books out about him. And now I'm being asked to blurb um, scholarly books about Elroy every every couple of years. There's, there's at least <laughs> half a dozen. And um, a colleague of mine, by the name of Nathan Ashman, who works at University of East Anglia, he he and I are guest editors of um, of a special James Alroy uh, issue of the journal Clues, a journal of detection, which is the the premium um, scholarly journal about crime fiction. So we're guest editing a, uh, a an issue on Alroy, and that will be coming out in 2026, which might seem like a long time away but in academic in the in the world of academia <laughs> like next weekend so so we're working hard on that and uh we're just really excited and we're finding that, that um 
it's it's easier now. Publishers will listen to you if if you if you come to them with really good scholarly subject in the crime fiction field. And yeah, it's been the last thirty years or so that it's just opened up. Yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on this. With like I, I as I said, I love Ross McDonald on the American side, and uh, he. I guess you you mentioned yeah these kind of mystery books and things and kind of the Conan Doyle style with these detective or, or detective going through. But McDonald had that essay years ago, I believe, where it was it in the Atlantic or something, um, where he talked about tracing the kind of, cause you know, McDonald was kind of, I guess the more scholarly guy, he was the PhD holder that was doing this yeah. kind of stuff and, uh, about tracing the kind of American crime novel or crime story to, uh, Poe. And Edgar Allan Poe's kind of writing. I'm just curious, your thoughts on that, theories on that, or, or what do you think of that? Well, I mean, I think McDonald's view is is perfectly valid in as far as it goes, and and like and Margaret Miller as well uh, was a was a great uh, thinker. You know, um, I I think the problem with if you try to find the genesis of crime fiction and you put one starting point someone's always going to find something before that. Uh, I mean, I've, I've noticed critics even trace crime fiction like back to biblical writing. <laughs> um, uh, you know, canonical books of the Bible. And, and the arguments they've set forth, um, like certain, like, or even just the disciples using tradecraft to keep the Last Supper a secret or or, or something like that, you know, uh, all of stories mysteries in the book of daniel and those sorts of things are, are, are really really interesting um of course very few writers um, well maybe maybe it's different now because it's a commercial proposition but very few writers actually think i'm going to write a book in this particular literary movement um they have their influences of course uh, but most most writers just have a story they want to tell and as it happens, it, it tends to fit into the into a certain uh, genre. But I mean, obviously, I mean, there are masters uh, of the genre uh, that we revere. And I mean, I think Poe is one of them. And, and uh, it, it, in a sense, um, similar things were happening in, in Britain at the time with like the Penny Dreadfuls, but also in a literary perspective, you know, Dickens is often regarded as one of the all time great mystery writers. Yeah. That, that's very interesting. I'm a, I'm a big Dickens fan too. And I think of the writers from that era, Dickens stuff kind of tends to hold up the best, you know, reading it 200 years later, you're like, Oh wow. This it's still, the jokes still work, <laughs> you know, like all of that. And yeah. the, yeah, the mysteries and all that. That's very interesting. Yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to determine. Yeah, and I, that's part of the fun of scholarship is like, oh, you know, kind of where did this come from? Who did it first? Uh, how did it snowball into over thousands of years? And very yeah. interesting to think about. Yeah. But all right. Yeah, that's that's very good. So we got uh, we got Stephen Powell coming in, young kid reading some novels and then turning into uh, what when did you start getting into the scholarly side? Was it college or? Yeah, well, um, yes. Yeah, so I did um, an, uh, an English degree. And, you know, in the UK, you usually just pick a subject and you do a degree on that thing. It's like different in America when you, you do a couple of years and then you major in something. And then it happens as an American to blame for this. Uh, <laughs> I, met, I, met, I met my wife. My wife, Diane, is from Detroit. And I met her at the University of Liverpool. And um, she said she knew I was obsessed with James R. Roy. And I didn't think I could do a PhD on him because there was no scholarly writing on him. You know, he's, he's still, he was even younger then. He would have been in his late 50s, I suppose. Or, um, he, he was still writing. It takes time. Um, and, and of course, this is this uh, prejudice. <laughs> most, most writers who are, be, who are having articles written about them, scholarly articles, are usually dead. Right. <laughs> so and I, so I said I, I really don't know if I can do one on Al Roy but her encouragement and a wonderful professor at the University of Liverpool uh, Professor David Seed he was very keen on the idea he said I think Al Roy would be a marvellous writer to, to, to write about and um, 
so I started. I remember in my first year, I remember thinking, I really wouldn't it be great if uh, out of all this PhD stuff, if I actually got to meet the man. I think that was probably my only ambition to know him on any personal le- level to meet him. Maybe I thought, you know, a, a, a real one to one with him. Uh, little did I know that not only would I get to meet him, I'd get to write his biography. I'd spend hundreds of hours talking to him. But again, that's a bit further down the road. <laughs> Yeah, so when you were doing your PhD on it, were you were like, uh, was this the early aughts? Uh... Let's see, yeah. Um, I, I actually did my first, my first two books were published before I finished my PhD. I had to take a break. So they were published in 2012, and I think I finally graduated in 2015. The years kind of merge into war. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and actually, James Elroy, Demon Dog of crime fiction which was published by palgrave that was my monograph that was basic that started as my phd and i rewrote it to kind of monograph specifications i kind of rewrote the arguments in it a bit more i mean the ba- basic argument in my phd which i i thought was kind of revolutionary i'm not sure if it is really <laughs> but i was very much interested in alroy's demon dog persona and i i i very much wanted to argue that it's not it's not just about him howling in bookshops and just being a bit outrageous and, you know, being a bit right wing and telling very blackly comic jokes and that sort of thing. I really feel I use the present tense because I still think it's valid. It is that the demon dog persona was in itself a kind of narrative device and that the demon dog is both on the page, but he could use it externally, you know, for his many media appearances and it was very, very finely honed um, a persona. And I tried to trace the honing of that persona as much as I could. And then a few years ago, uh, when I was writing the biography, I interviewed Andrew Vax, the novelist, the crime novelist, you know, who wrote the Burke novels, who knew Alroy for a few years, they were friends. And he told me, well, the thing with James is he tried on a few personas before he found one that fit. And that really opened my eyes to it um, because I felt like, well, we know him as the demon dog. We have this very specific view of Alroy. He's got a completely unique look. His physiognomy is completely unique. Uh, His his voice, his cadence, his his jokes are almost completely unique. Wouldn't it have been interesting if he'd have chosen something else other than that? Or if he... you know, if you try to be more like Tom Wolfe or something, it, that 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 really would have been fascinating. I think you know, American literary history of the past twenty years would have been very different if he'd have chosen a different persona. That's so interesting. I I just had a conversation with someone uh, for this podcast that was uh, about artists and their personas, and and this kind of you know, Brady Sinellis, the American writer, has talked about this where he said there was there was the real him. And then there was kind of this media version of him where, and then you kind of, you can lean into it, you can lean out of it, you can create your own, you can reinvent that persona. You know, a lot of artists do that and throughout time. And, but yeah, Elroy is, is that, yeah, that the crazy shirts and the, and the, <laughs> and the, uh, the documentaries, the, the car, right? Like the car, what was that documentary yeah. when he's driving around in that convertible in LA? And, uh, yeah, yeah that's just, it's so fascinating to see and, and how you can use that to your advantage, like not just in media appearances, but in the art creation too, is just so, I mean, that's so fascinating. Yeah. Like for, for that's fantastic. I'm, I'm glad you're doing this work <laughs> that you're doing this work oh, and especially for somebody like Elroy where, yeah, like I said, okay, so this was, you know, your first couple books on this 2011, 2012 ish, 2013 ish was, Nobody was really doing that. And I guess, yeah, Elroy was still alive and it was only we'd been publishing, what, like 30 years at that point. And uh, yeah, to take that on is just fantastic. Yeah. What, uh, how, how did you, how did you first discover Elroy? And you mentioned a little bit about this being kind of a young kid and just, just getting those big doorstop novels of his, you know. Uh, the details, the twists, the turns, the kind of how, how did, what got you into Elroy? How did you first discover it? And then what made you fall in love with his work? 
I first discovered him. My first Elroy book was American Tabloid. So I, I started pretty big and pretty kind of late career. What, what was then late career? Because I, I was 16. I was on holiday on the south coast of England, uh, a little place called Bournemouth, seaside resort. I was just in a book shop. And the cover of American Tabloid, it was an artist's rendition of the um, Kennedy Cavalcade in um, Dallas, you know, November 1963. And I, it was a striking image, so I picked up the book, I bought it, didn't know who James Arrow was, and just read a few pages, and I was hooked. Um, the, the violence, of, the story started right away. There's an immediacy to it. That, that really impressed me. Like he, he had a, he had a great confidence in, in in pushing you into the maelstrom of events. So and 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 the book itself, that one was designed as like the inside scoop of the Kennedy assassination, which again took a lot of confidence because this being the mid nineties, we'd already had Oliver Stone's JFK, and it was it was a, it was a it's a subject that everybody's got an opinion on, whether you're lone gunman or you're conspiracy theory, which conspiracy theory, um, but. It really felt so vivid and plausible to me that I almost felt like I, I was in in America in 1963. That's what the best authors do. They take you somewhere. So naturally, I had to go out then and devour everything else I, I could find about this James Alroy. Um, and again, this was slightly pre-internet. So I was just looking up newspaper articles. The reason I was looking at newspaper articles, I just had the author photograph of this rather severe looking bald man with this um with this very intense stare and this obsessiveness uh in, in these author images. And I think in a way that that you feed off that you I fed, I fed off his energy. The books have this remarkable energy to them. Uh, and I remember finishing books like White Jazz and being literally breathless, like I'd, I'd just been on on this really, f just been joyriding in a car or something, and I just had this big adrenaline rush, which we don't necessarily associate with sitting in an armchair and reading a paperback novel, <laughs> but, but but remarkably it had given me this huge uh, rush. So it was an obsession. Um, and you know it, it just it just it just spiraled um when i was working on Al alroy from a scholarly perspective i think there was something at the back of my mind that felt like i'm either going to write the biography or i'm going to co-write it i don't know because i was collecting kind of um just arcane memorabilia or just details about his life any tiny minute detail i could find and obviously, a lot of that wasn't really relevant to a thesis, which is an academic argument. Um, you know, theses are not full of factoids. They're, they're full of literary movement and discussion and critiques and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, I was just creating this huge inventory of facts, dates, times, places, mapping where he was. I mean, I was almost stalking the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to come in handy. Um I knew, I knew. I probably knew that if if I found out as much as I could about his movements and what he fought on any particular subject on any day and how that would change over the t time, that is essentially, uh, yeah, I think I probably knew at the back of my mind that maybe this biography was going to happen. But and it was just like sp spiraling. Like he was just you were sixteen, get that first novel, and then it was just seeking out everything that was on, you know, everything he'd published. And yeah, I guess. If I yeah, that time it was the the American Underworld trilogy was fully out, all of that, and and you could just go one, two, three, you know, bang him out. But uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. No, yeah, well, um, I mean, I so I started, yeah, I so American Tabloid was first, and I read all of the um, Los Angeles Quartet. I remember the first one that I. The first time he published a new book and I'd had this obsession with him was uh, The Cold 6000. I can remember queuing up outside Waterstones very early in the morning, Waterstones is a big UK bookseller, uh, to, to buy that book. I mean, he wasn't even there, but the queues, that was his biggest hardback bestseller, uh, still is, that he was really hitting fever pitch then. 
And then I remember going back and reading his very first novels because he really hit the big time of the Black um, Dahlia in 1987, his seventh novel. And then I read the six he'd written prior to that. And I remember feeling maybe just a tad disappointed with them only because they weren't extraordinary. They were just very, very, very good. And that's an ex- and I think he was very much finding his voice. But those first novels like Brown's Requiem and Clandestine, they probably do seem a little bit conventional now compared to the, to the pro style and the plotting and just the idiosyncrasies in the text and how he, how he made Los Angeles, particularly 1950s Los Angeles, his own. Um, so, um, yeah, so I was, I was, I was devouring everything. Definitely. Yeah. And you mentioned the confidence already. And I think that's part of the appeal of him as well. Like when you, you know, who was that guy who was like an old American pulp writer who had like that formula for it where he was just, and you said you meant was you got older noticing that you were disappointed in some of the more formulaic stuff where he said the step one is kill somebody in an unusual way, you know, pile trouble on the hero, you know, and then like have him get in a fight by this point. And then, you know, you kind of have these, again, because those guys were just cranking them out, like in a matter of days, you know, for that, for pennies, for pennies. And yeah, just his confidence. Um, Yeah. What do you? Well, yeah, I mean, funnily enough, if you go back to the 30s and 40s, talking about writers with formulas, even though academics were ignoring them and, and many critics were ignoring them, but crime writers themselves were talking about what they did a lot. Yeah, they were. I mean, Chandler would talk about Ross MacDonald. He would also write about uh, Hammett. And um, that's where I got the title Venetian Vase from, for my website. It's from the quote, Hammett took murder out of the Venetian Vase and gave it back to the people it belonged to. Because Chandler really didn't like the Golden Age British detective story. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, there there were numerous attempts to map out the rules of of detective fiction. And and naturally, they became quite formulaic. I mean, the the writers we look for today, I mean, the writers I look for as a reader are the ones who break the formula. Fortunately, I think because publishing is contracting and it's got this big threat which is the internet and people's attention spans contracting, you know, because of the phones and whatnot, is that they're almost getting more and more formulaic and more and more safe. And um, a lot of the books I grew up with, which were kind of spy and espionage and adventure fiction, I think a lot of those have been squeezed out of the market for basically just detective fiction with a kind of dark, troubled protagonist who's a bit traumatized because of something in his or her past. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I There was a writer, I was listening to an interview, and uh, he said just certain genres have been completely squeezed out of the industry. Like Some of that adventure fiction stuff is essentially just... Uh, completely gone or it's just in the realm of self-publishing you know with the big giants like amazon where you can just anybody could write one and put it out there and yeah most of them are pretty disappointing you know they either follow the formula or they kind of go nowhere or they're they're yeah. um amateur actually, you know that word whatever but it's it's yeah. it is kind of a shame too for that it, it, and it almost seems like yeah that maybe some are running out of ideas but then you have a, a, somebody like elroy this giant uh uh, just keeping it alive almost like who else is writing that kind of, you know, crime nor fiction. Yeah. It's uh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I know with Elroy's recent stuff, the enchanters, he became very nostalgic say a year or two before he started writing the enchanters for the kind of Irving Wallace, Harold Robbins kind of melodramas. Uh, those kind of door-stopping mid-20th century books that were huge sellers. And he wanted to write a, a book that would almost be a tribute to the, the kind of Wallace, Wallace Robbins, I mean, very consciously trashy uh, novels uh, and had his own spin on it. And I thought that was, you know, I thought that was such a brave thing to do because we don't see books like that anymore. And Al Roy was going to set out and write one. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, I think, I think broadly he succeeded. I think The Enchanters was one of his best novels in years, especially as someone who rather struggled with Perfidia and the Storm. Um, 
some of our more recent work, you know, set during wartime and second Allied Quartet and all being prequels and whatnot, I, 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 I struggled with them. So I thought it was interesting that Alroy was going to go back to his more classic territory, but also go back to his more classic influences and the books that influenced him, uh, mostly when he was a kid. Yeah, there's that confidence again, right? Elroy yeah. just coming out of there. And I, I just like his public appearances when he's, he just claims, he's like, every one of my books is a masterpiece. You know, <laughs> I'll just say that. He's like, only preceded by my next masterpiece, you know, like yeah. that's yet yeah. to come out. And just going back and being able to do that. I wonder, yeah, if and somebody that has his stature in the industry where he'd be allowed to do something like that. You know, what, I do look at a lot of these writers that are, kind of let i mean not that they're letting it you know it's not up to them uh necessarily but just yeah you know if you have a little bit of sway why not you know yeah be confident about it and be like yeah you know i'm just gonna bring this back i'm just gonna at least try you know to to bring back a big swing for the fences there but uh i imagine you've spent a lot of time with elroy himself right uh what was that like you know i've heard many mixed things about this you know his and again that confidence uh uh, the documentary filmmakers he would hire and stuff to follow him around and yeah, yeah. What, what is he like um he is i mean he, i think he would surprise you he is a gentleman first and foremost and i think a lot of the rules of decorum and civility are very important to him so i mean uh, uh and maybe we had that kind of um connection because being english i am a little bit stiff and awkward around people maybe upon first meeting them but i also i also believe in civility first and then kind of uh, once i relax and become friendly with people I, I i usually develop an intimacy with them and it was very much the same with him so it was um it it, it was it was really a case of gaining his trust which would be Obviously, letting him do the speaking, uh, you're doing eight percent speaking because you know he's 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 the more important person. I'm I make no, I'm under no illusion of a wise, but letting him talk, letting him lead the conversation, and um, because I, one of the great things I think I'd done was that I'd studied every printed interview with him, so I'd seen journalists pack him off, either you know, talking too much or getting too opinionated or going off subject. So what I did was very much let him lead and just just let him talk. I mean, it it wasn't that difficult. He's a great raconteur. Uh, You know, he loves a good story, loves a good joke. And when you... um, I've got a friend who's a, who's, uh, a conflict journalist. He's South African. And he told me, because he's done a lot of um, very difficult interviews with kind of traumatized victims of war zones. And he said, doing an interview is so easy, you just, you're just you're silent. <laughs> you know, you yeah. don't have to say enough. Because people hate silence, so you, you, they will fill that silence for you. Um, and that's a, it's a simplification, but I, I, would, I, I, would, I would just, you know, ask leading questions, let him, let him do the talking and it, it was all fine. There were, there were some tense moments because when you're dealing with somebody's trauma, you don't want to say anything that even has a, a whiff of judgmentalism about it or being insensitive. And I, I mean, it all depends on, on the prejudices of that particular person. I mean, some people don't like to talk about past relationships. I really love to talk about past relationships. <laughs> Um, he was less keen on talking about his mother. That seemed to be a big wall for him. And he'd built up all manner of defenses, uh, all, all of which were quite charming in the way. It, you know, um, I think 90% of charm is evasion. <laughs> and he, he just built up these evasive techniques. And I just respected that. Uh, but occasionally I'd hear him say something he'd he'd think of a piece of music that his mother liked for instance and then i would just let him lead on that because you didn't know where it might go it might go somewhere really good i would you know you don't want to ask anything 
to inflammatory like or what when did you last see your mother or what was your last memory of your mother that would be far too direct uh, so it was it was good we had a good relationship we made each other laugh i mean he made me laugh more but i made him laugh a few times which i'm very proud of <laughs> yeah it's interesting i my father-in-law is a, a retired uh, dc cop uh, here in america oh. and he always said that he said you know the trick to interviewing interrogation is just like just don't say anything he's like they'll just incriminate themselves you just <laughs> he's like, you just let them keep talking and it'll give you all the answers you know <laughs> that you're looking for yeah. but i wonder Absolutely. uh since you said this kind of like um you had this idea and this kind of more academic theory but obviously it turns out to be i think more true right like this kind of about his persona like do you think that helped you in terms of going in there and you you know did you do it like journalistic style just tape recorder on the table you know talking or uh yeah all the conversations were, were, were recorded uh i mean a lot of this was at the height of lockdown so it was by by phone and then i persuaded him finally to do zoom and um and but obviously I've, I've, I've met him i've spent time with him in person um probably the hairiest moment was and this is all a matter of record now but one of alroy's ex-partners a woman by the name of erica schickel wrote a memoir called the big hurt about it was it was about her life but it was also about her relationship with james alroy this was after a second divorce in, in the late noughties. Now, the relationship had been tempestuous. It had been passionate. And I'd interviewed Erica, and Alroy didn't have a problem with me interviewing Erica. who's was keen for me to interview everyone. And I, I, I like Erica a lot. I think she's a, you know, a marvelous woman. And uh, But Alroy naturally didn't want to read this memoir, which he thought was just going to be a kiss and tell. So uh, I read it for him. I read it and I went into a meeting with him and had to tell him everything that was in it. And that was a bit nerve wracking, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, it was also quite funny because it was, um, I think, about halfway through the interview of, of me explaining everything that was in this book that Erica had written, Alroy began to treat me, began to look at me as if I was Erica. And it was like we were having this couple's tiff. And he was just like, no, that's not true. And, you know, no, I never said that. It's like, how could you think that? And, and I was just, oh, my gosh, it was it was tense. But at the end, he was totally disarming. And he, he, he took it all quite well, considering it kind of been an easy conversation for him to have. And he, he just flashed this brilliant smile and said, oh, you never have to worry about telling me anything, Steve. Um, and, uh, he he was he was he was quite disarming about it. So that was uh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you recorded all this too with your kind of your transcripts and all that, and put it out with this because it is, even if it's not like you know a bestseller or anything. I mean, it, you know, you just think 50, 100 years from now, how many writers do we actually have that intimate transcript with? You know, it's just. You're doing yeah. God's work over there, Steve. <laughs> you know, <you're... laughs> thank you. Thank, you. thank uh, you. And getting to your book here, yeah. Uh, again, listeners, link to the description. Pick up a copy. Uh, what was the process like for you writing such a comprehensive, you know, biography like this? And how did that affect you? Like, you know, like most writing, I assume it took something from you, right? Like you said, telling these stories, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of, you know, what draws us into writers and creativity. And then even, I think, scholarship, too, as you, as you said, like, you know, at least some energy it takes from you or things like that. So, yeah, what was that process like, writing such a comprehensive thing? Well, I mean, the process existed on many levels. So, like, there, there would be the, the conversations with Alroy, which were regular, and which were updates uh, often from me about what I've been doing, but also him filling out chapters of his life and talking about things. Getting interviews with everyone I could lay my hands on. So friends, colleagues, uh, ex-partners again was a big one because he's had a very active love life. Uh, and that was interesting because you'd have to send out many, many interview requests and then do follow-ups. Uh, some of it would be easy. Uh, for instance, he has a 
knack for dating academics and literary agents, probably because you date people in the same profession of you, I guess. So I so those people tend to have a public profile. So I just got lucky there. But also to, to get the interviews with the Hollywood people, you'd have to go through their agents, their lawyers, their managers. So it was just <laughs> constantly knocking at people's doors, you know, digitally speaking. Uh, and of course, there was the writing itself. So the volume of material I was getting in was huge. Uh, people were really opening up. And for a, for a guy who lived his life in the public eye, as Elroy has, I was amazed at how much new material I was getting from people. So I'd say to your listeners, if you think you know Elroy because you've read My Dark Places, his memoir, uh, you've, you've got to read the biography because there was so much material I was getting that was completely new. And a lot of people had like friends and the friend, the friendship interviews were very much like the ex-girlfriend interviews because he tended to treat his friends in a similar way. There'd be a kind of seduction. There'd be a period of great activity where he would shower them with affection and then he'd cut them off very, very abruptly. So the friends often felt like jilted lovers. But um, they, when I approached these people, it was almost like, yeah, I knew Al Roy. What took you so long? They had this, I've been waiting for you. Um <laughs> Uh, feeling about them, even though I didn't know these people, but it's almost like <laughs> I've really been waiting to tell this story about how I knew Elroy because they witnessed history and everybody wants to say, I was there, I saw that, or I did that. Um, uh, and so it was a frantic case of the volume of material getting in was huge, writing it up into narrative form at the same time. And of course, I, I, I have all the responsibilities as you know, I have academic responsibilities as well. And so it was a really, really busy time in my life. But like I say, a lot of it was over lockdown. So I was very, very lucky that I had I had a great lockdown. It was fascinating. Um, I was never bored. It was absolutely wonderful. And I think just every so often in your life, you will land a dream project. Maybe it's only once, maybe it's five times you will land a dream project. And I think I just found reserves of strength in myself that I never knew I had that would that would take me through to the conclusion of getting this book out. Um, maybe it's because I've written books and I'll read before. It's just I knew I, I knew I was going to finish it. I knew I was going to do it. And how did you like you said there was all this like huge body of material like how, how did, did you have to develop a kind of a new process in terms of writing, like to dig through all that, how you wanted to sort it, like, you know, the work of writing about writing any book is like so much, but then doing a biography and like you said, having a responsibility or feeling like you do to do it justice, you know, and, and be fair and, and all of that. Like, uh, was there a process that you had to kind of invent, you know, to, uh, to, to help yourself do that? Well, I, I considered a number of options. One is because of the volume of material, I thought about splitting it into a free volume biography. Uh, but then I had to take into my commercial considerations and I, did, and I thought, well, if I do that, it might become too hagiographic. I, I, I don't, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me, but I don't think every reader out there wants to know where Alroy is on every particular day of his life. I want it to reflect Elroy's personality, which was to be fast moving and intense and obsessive and a real page turner to, to, for it to be like an Elroy novel. Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember one, uh, one decision I made about midway through when I saw the volume of material and I saw the pacing of it was going to be very, very fast because Alroy lives fast and he's juggling a lot of things, is that I broke the chapters down. Um, I, I basically doubled the number of chapters, but I didn't make the book longer. I just I just, I just, I just broke them down to make it easier to read and just to, just to make that speed go faster. Um, I, I did, I don't, um, I, I know a lot of writers thrive on, on structure and order, but I wouldn't know what I would be doing on certain days because an interview request might come in. It might be a Hollywood person. So now when you're dealing with a Hollywood person, you don't want to lose your chance to interview them. So if they say, I'll talk to you at this time, which happens to be 2 a.m. UK time, you're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> just say, yeah. So then I would just put aside what I was doing and focus on that interview. 
Um, I have a friend, a New York-based writer called Jill Derman, who's, who's written a few novels, and she says, uh, uh, to be a good writer, make sure you do an hour a day. And, and she's often surprised that people say, oh, an hour a day, that's nowhere near enough. Well, maybe not, but like a lot of writers end up not doing that hour, and then 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 you've lost so much. If you've done an hour a day, you've done a good day's work as a writer because it's not easy. Um, and when you're really flying, you can do much more than that. Um, so that was it. Because um, like I'd spend many more hours like plowing through documents, like legal forms and. Um, Oh, you know everything from high school yearbooks to divorce records, marriage records, yeah. property records, electoral registers, um, anything that would either prove this person existed uh, at this time or would help me track someone down. You know, that's. I mean, it's great to hear, and I, I like how you said that it was. It wasn't so much that you created these rules or anything; it was just kind of you were flowing with it, and I think it shows in the final product too. You know, like it, how the flows yeah. into each section. And you kind of get this fast pace from a from a biography, you know, like it's uh, it's just, I'm always fascinated by writers methods. So that's why I'm always asking and this is kind of a writing podcast. We like to we like to yeah, listeners sure. like to know that stuff here. So, yeah, very yeah. cool. Uh, and it shows. Yeah. Uh, with the title. Very good title. Mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. Uh, where did you get yeah. that? How did it come from? How did it come about? Well, it, uh, Love Me, Fist and Danger is the last line of Alroy's novel, White Jazz. And that was one that left me particularly breathless. And I remember that last line in particular always just hit me in the heart. And it just grabbed me. And um, <laughs> it's a funny one. And, and, and I'd, I'd thought about it being the title of the biography when I, when I first started. And, I was like, and then I got a bit put off. I was like, no, it's a bit long. Uh, and I just had a working title like James Alroy, the biography. And one day James says to me, oh, Steve, that's too flat. And he wanted to call it something called like the Night Runner. Over, uh, after an old film noir called the Night Runner, he's very fond of. And then he's like, and then he, he was saying things like running, the, the, the night running man, or, or run is a strong verb, Steve. Have you thought about run? Run. He kept, he kept hearing on this word, run, running. So I said, James, um, why don't I just call it Love Me First in Danger? And he's like, oh, that's amazing. That's fabulous. <laughs> I was like, what was that about running? He's like, no, no, forget running. <laughs> <laughs> Scrap running. No, <clears throat> Love Me First in Danger is the title. Um, and he sent me a case of Johnny Walker whiskey. He was so thrilled. Um, he, you know, he doesn't drink. He's an alcoholic, so we can't drink. And he said, this, this is stuff I would drink if I could. Um, and he was absolutely, um, he was absolutely thrilled with that title. Yeah. I love that. He, uh, was, uh, uh, had a little, uh, a little bit of an input in that too. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, moving on a little bit, uh, Elroy and movie adaptations, uh, yeah. kind of the adaptations of his work, you know, from what I've read of him and again, I'm, I'm nowhere near as, uh, well versed in it as you are. Uh, he seems to not like any of them, you know, and, uh, and just kind of your idea of why do you think that is, or at least why do his books, they, they, again, maybe because they're so big, but like, why do they never seem to translate well into film projects, at least to his liking or. Oh, excellent question. Well, with Ally Confidential, it's slightly odd because that's the version that almost everybody likes. You know, the, it's considered a critic's darling of a film and one of the great neo-noir films, but Alroy doesn't like it. Hey, would you believe there's still an extra hour of conversation left? Well, there is. And if you want to hear the full, uncensored episode, you need to subscribe at patreon.com slash heavyboard, where you will receive full, uncensored episodes like this, without any interruptions, ads, or anything else. And that's for subscribers only at patreon.com slash heavyboard. So... What are you waiting for? Stop sitting on the sidelines. Subscribe today and join the conversation. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored.
such a lack of gratitude for life. Bored. I, I aspire to boredom, Heavy. I should say. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Has your night sweats and the day sweats, pal? Pal, I do.